Well, thank you all for coming. It's nice to see so many old friends and so many new faces all in the same audience. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, I agreed to come out for this ELA workshop, uh, I was asked if I'd give a kickoff lecture. And I had a lot of things on my plate at the time, and they were pressing me for a title. And uh, without too much thought, I came up with the title here. After which I found uh, I would need about five hours to cover it. So <laughs> I will give you a partial introduction to Canada's freshwater problems. I think one of the problems is shown by the figures on this slide. In most of the world's eyes, we don't have any freshwater uh, problems. Gray on here, as you can see, is the lowest of stresses. And while uh, stress peculiarly seems to end at the border, high stress in the Dakotas and no stress uh, north of the border, uh, that's the way people think of Canada. So what I'm going to do today is uh, to try to dispel that. Uh, but before I do, notice the high stress areas on this. It shows you why the global population of humans is in, in uh, really deep doo-doo. Uh, some of these statistics illustrate what's going on. Uh, we're using over a quarter of the continental runoff, and that we're not using generally flows to areas that there's no people, like the, the high Arctic. Uh, a billion people don't have freshwater production. They're living in semi-arid and arid areas. And very few have abundant fresh water. Uh, over three billion people either have uh, uh, water that's not safe to drink or not safe to clean up uh, for sanitation. And of course, there's all sorts of waterborne diseases that uh, uh, kill people every year, a lot of them uh, very young people. <clears throat> and if you look at the global loss of biodiversity that uh, everyone talks about in general, the highest losses are in freshwater systems. So when I sat down to try to, try to, to outline this talk, I came up with this list. And as you'll notice, I'm not going to talk about everything on this list. And in fact, I can't uh, give any detail about any of them, but I'm going to give you some examples that I hope will be food for thought about uh, where we have to go with the uh, water management and treatment of water in this country. I think this is the first eye opener. Uh, most people just dismiss Canada as having lots of water. But if you look at a couple of areas here, uh, the so-called empire of dust here in, in uh, southern uh, uh, Alberta and, and adjacent Saskatchewan, and another one that I'll talk a little bit about, this red area uh, here in the Okanagan Valley. We have some areas uh, where there's water stress because of natural phenomena. There's not much runoff. Evapotranspiration is higher than precipitation. And the only reason, for example, that people can live in places like Calgary and Lethbridge and Medicine Hat is because of the water flow from the Rocky Mountains. So I'll be talking a bit about those. Uh, this uh, slide was turned out uh, a few years ago by John Sprague. And as, again, you can see that it gives you some food for thought. Normally, uh, if you read the papers, they consider China and the US to be water-stressed countries. And they say Canada's not. But if you look at the runoff, the annual runoff, Canada's of the same magnitude. And in addition to that, our runoff is not well distributed. As you could see from the earlier graph, the driest part of Canada tends to be in the south, where all the people live. And uh, the north has lots of water and the majority of the flow. So what that tells me is that we had better be careful or we will be joining more populous and industrialized countries like uh, China and the USA as countries under water stress. 
And the other stressor that we hear a lot about recently, of course, is climate warming. Uh, as you'll see, we already have a lot of evidence of climate warming, and of course, uh, this very week with the storms here in southern Ontario, and as we speak, people being evacuated from southern Alberta for the second June in a row due to high river flows, uh, uh, it's generally thought that those might have something to do with uh, warming of the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. And of course, there are a lot of people who don't believe in that. It seems to be centered in Alberta, where a new billboard uh, just went up in Calgary uh, by the so-called friends of science, uh, saying that uh, CO2 doesn't cause greenhouse warming, the sun does. So uh, <laughs> there's still a lot of disinformation out there. But if you look at the projections for a doubling of CO2, uh, which we're on track for uh, on or before the middle of this century and four times CO2 that if we don't uh, do anything more than we're doing now will happen before the end of this century. You can see that particularly in northern Canada and in fact through much of Canada we're going to see some pretty extreme climate change. In fact most of southern Canada has already I uh, experienced two to two and a half degrees of warming even at this latitude. <clears throat> so one of the areas of concern, not because it's really short of water, but because of the huge population is right here on the Great Lakes. Uh, a year ago, people were worried about the uh, uh, declining ice cover. And actually this prediction was made by Jim Bruce and myself, Jim's in the front row here, in an adaptation uh, piece that we did for uh, a, a, a volume put out by Blair Feltnate and Jason Thistlewaite from here. And that is the decline in ice cover in the Great Lakes. Uh, these uh, uh, bright surfaces, like ice with a bit of snow on it, reflect a lot of light. Instead, the dark surface of water absorbs a lot of light, causing higher temperatures, uh, more evaporation, higher wind velocities because of the warmer atmosphere, and in summer, longer, longer thermal stratification, which uh, causes more oxygen depletion down deep, liberating phosphorus to enhance eutrophication. And then, of course, 2014 came along, and it's right up with the highest values. I think the trend is still statistically significant, but it shows you the sort of variability that scientists have to deal with. But going now to the empire of dust, uh, the main river flowing that more populous part of Alberta is the uh, Saskatchewan, the South Saskatchewan and its tributaries, uh, most notably the old man and the bow. They're fed uh, by glaciers in the Rockies. This is the Bow Glacier, a photo taken in 1897. Uh, Graham Pohl uh, found that picture in the White Museum, went back to exactly the same spot uh, in 2002. That's actually the same tree. It hasn't hit the ground yet. It's moved <laughs> about 30 degrees. But look at what's happened to Bow Glacier, which is the uh, primary source of water for the Bow River. And of course, uh, uh, the downward trend uh, in, in glaciers is widespread. This is the Athabasca Glacier, farther north in the, the same range, and it too has, uh, has declined about a kilometer and a half in length and quite a bit in, in depth as well. Uh, and the other big fear is that paleoecologists in recent years, going back in time using tree rings and showing that they could interpret tree ring width as a measure of drought, found that the 20th century was unusually wet. If you go back uh, before the 20th century, you see these yellow and red areas here. The red ones are droughts that lasted a decade or more and the others are droughts that lasted several years. So uh, 
it seems unlikely that we'll have two years or two, two centuries in a row that have above normal precipitation. But uh, that's hard to say. And then, of course, the other threat, uh, particularly high in Alberta, is population growth. Uh, it's the highest growing part of, of, of Canada as a large area, uh, 44 times in the 20th century, as opposed to an average of, of sixfold for all of Canada. And uh, I think it's time that we needed to start the debate over what's an optimum population for Canada and how do we stabilize the population when we get there. Uh, obviously, there are uh, many ways to do it. If you study ecology, you know that it involves births and deaths and emigration and immigration, all of which can be controlled either by incentives or disincentives. But some of the means of doing that are, are much less palatable than others. And uh, it's not only scientists who need to get involved in making those decisions, but I think to lay out the groundwork that we need, uh, uh, it's science that needs to do it. And that population is having a huge effect. This is what happened to Calgary during the 20th century, and this is what's predicted. Uh, the uh, boundary of Banff is about here, and as you can see, Cochrane, which uh, 25 years ago when uh, I moved to Alberta, was a nice little ranching town, is now a, a, a bedtime community for downtown Calgary. So this huge expansion of population and the adjacent uh, problems, the problems that go with it, not only sewage and nutrients, but also paved areas and the runoff from those and the pesticide use and other chemicals used in cities and uh, the runoff of those to water courses. And then the poor old Bow River gets uh, uh, another problem. I actually, both the Bow and the Old Man, and they're two of the three major tributaries to the South Saskatchewan. Between the two of them, they account for 70% of the irrigation water use in Canada. And uh, this uh, figure is pretty stable out here. I couldn't find a, a, a slide this good of the uh, figures after 2000, but they haven't declined. So a lot of water, actually 70% of the non-renewable use in the country uh, are by irrigated agriculture. And uh, in the drought years of the uh, early 2000s, this is what the uh, uh, dam on the Bow River looked like just below Calgary. You could wade across this without getting your knees wet. And you can see that there's scarcely any water going over the dam at all. And downstream of that, the South Saskatchewan River. This is the summer flow long term. We couldn't do all year flow because some years are missing spring and fall flows probably back here because people were getting their horses and buggies stuck. But uh, the overall trend is uh, uh, down by about 80 some percent. And as a result of all of those things coming together, the 31 reaches of the South Saskatchewan, the only ones that are relatively unchanged are a couple in the Red Deer River Basin, the least impacted of the three. And uh, the heavy impacts and degraded ones are all in the, uh, in the Bow and, and the uh, uh, Old Man Basins where the big populations like Calgary and Lethbridge live. But all of that and all of those predictions were done before June of last year. This is Cougar Creek uh, in its natural state. This is actually taken just above where it runs through Canmore. Most of you are aware of the huge flood of Canmore and then Calgary and High River uh, as uh, uh, over 200 millimeters of precipitation fell on part of that system last year be before it was completely thawed and while the soils were still saturated. This is uh, what 
that system looks like now as it goes through, uh, through Calgary. Uh, it just leaves you grinding your teeth. Uh, I mean, we have really learned nothing in 50 years. We still let engineers do this to natural streams. This might be good news for Canmore. I can tell you it's not good news for Calgary. Uh, this is like building an outhouse and then having somebody put in a second layer of, of holes above your head. It's, uh, uh, it's absurd to see human beings still stupid enough to be doing this sort of remediation. And uh, uh, the other rivers in Alberta are also going down in summer flow, not so rapidly as the South Saskatchewan. And here you can see why. It's not only a huge population increase, but a huge industrial increase. You look at that latitude anywhere else in Canada, you can see there's very little going on. And you look at the intensity, and it's comparable to down here in the US Midwest somewhere. The other basin that uh, is underwater stress is the Okanagan Valley. Uh, the climate is semi-arid. You can tell just in a simple walk over the watershed. Uh, you don't want to walk barefoot because there are cacti around and so on. It has the lowest per capita, per capita water available in Canada. Huge population and rainfall almost as low as the, the southern part of Alberta. And it has the highest per capita water use. Uh, People use something like 600 uh, 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 liters per day per person, whereas uh, Edmonton's use, for example, is 200, and the average for Canada is less than 300. So for some reason in, in that basin, while they have good controls over water quality, nothing is being done about water quantity. The population has tripled in 20 years, and it's projected to triple again. Plus, every house doesn't have a green lawn. It has a vineyard or, or a fruit orchard or something. And climate change is affecting the Okanagan about the same as other uh, basins at that latitude across ca Canada. So talk about being able to see a perfect storm coming. Well, that's all I have to say about uh, water quantity and some of the problems we're facing. Now going to turn to water quality, and I would say the biggest water quality globally is eutrophication. Uh, the uh, problem which we thought we had uh, developed a solution for in the early 1970s is still the biggest problem in the world. And the reason it's a problem is because of weak-willed uh, uh, regulators uh, continually expanding land use and human populations, uh, and some confusion uh, among scientists, some of whom don't seem to be able to follow logical arguments. So uh, U.S., this costs a couple of billion dollars a year. Uh, costs a lot in drinking water treatment, especially if there are so-called blue-green algae or cyanobacteria releasing toxins into the water. And the UK, you can see, uh, uh, it also pays a lot. I'll give you some other figures later. It isn't as though these are, are trivial problems. And I put this in here deliberately because of uh, the de-emphasis of doing anything about environmental problems that's happening under the Harper government. Going back to when I started out at the Experimental Lakes area, the controversy uh, was how many nutrients do you need to control? Uh, Lake Erie was in this state in the early 1970s. And uh, the International Joint Commission had all but made a decision to control phosphorus as a result of interventions by Richard Vollenweider, who later won the Tyler Prize for his work on the problem, and, and Jack Valentine, who was my boss for a number of years. 
the case made against that by the industry, and by the industry in this case, I'm talking largely about the detergent industry, was that uh, there was evidence that carbon, not phosphorus, controlled eutrophication. They found three studies that were done in little beakers or, or mesocosms that showed that uh, adding phosphorus didn't do anything to the algae, uh, but if you didn't add carbon, they wouldn't grow, and if you added carbon, they grew a lot. So this was just at the time that we were starting in the experimental lakes area, and we had just discovered that this little lake, Lake 227, was the lowest carbon lake that had ever been studied. In fact, we had to develop some new methods to be able to measure it. So we thought it would be an interesting test of the hypothesis of the detergent industry to add other nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, to this lake and see what happened if it developed an algal bloom or not. And as you can see here, I uh, quickly developed an algal bloom indicating that their carbon theory had no substance to it. So that was pretty well the end in one quick experiment of the carbon theory of eutrophication. But they had new theories that you need to control nitrogen as well as, as phosphorus. So we did this experiment, uh, adding both nitrogen and carbon to two basins and phosphorus as well to, to this one. And uh, this picture uh, was taken and this experiment done just in time for the major fight over controlling nutrients uh, in the U.S. part of the Great Lakes. Canada had already legislated against phosphorus, but uh, this picture to these hearing panels, which in many cases didn't have any science represented on them at all, uh, spoke to people who didn't know any science. They could see exactly what was the, the cause of the problem. Uh, and as a result, finally, we got nutrient controls in the Great Lakes. And we had a number of lakes that have recovered as the result of controlling this one element. Well, strangely, there are still scientists out there running around saying that to get effective control, you need to control nitrogen as well. There are no examples, but that doesn't seem to bother them. So, as you can see, and this is probably a partial list, for some reason people don't seem to put titles on such as the recovery of Lake X from eutrophication. You have to go through a study titled something completely different and find out whether the lakes responded or not. So uh, this is all summarized in a paper I wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, but still, these nitrogen people are persisting and confounding the regulation problem. At the start of that period, when Lake Erie was at its worst, uh, we, this pie diagram would have been, uh, sorry, uh, about 50% municipal and industrial. Well, we eliminated the point sources, but the agricultural sources have exploded, both uh, runoff from uh, livestock and, and from agriculture. So we now have this non-point source, as it's called, as a huge problem. And this is what's caused the resurgence of the problem in Lake Erie. And I would say we knew this would happen. Uh, I can actually remember arguments that Richard Ballenbeider I, and I made with fisheries and oceans when they were threatening to cut off funding for eutrophication experiments, that we were only halfway there. What we had controlled is the result of our experiments and the resulting legislation are represented by only the white and the black bars here. You can see the shaded bar below that is uh, uh, land runoff. And of course, what's happened is we've intensified use of fertilizer and uh, uh, population on the land and livestock grown and everything else. So 
those non-point sources, which are more difficult to control, have come back. It's the same problem, the same element, but the control is more difficult this time. So the problem hasn't gone away as we'd all hoped uh, in the 1970s. This is Lake Winnipeg just a few years ago. Uh, this is Lac La Biche in Alberta. Uh, this was on a student exercise. The intention here was to get enough lake water in these white pans and then put some bottom sediment in and pick through the uh, insects that lived in bottom sediment. Uh, didn't work too well, as you can see. We actually had to go into town and buy some bottled water to, to do the experiment. This is almost a, a, a unicellular, a unispecies bloom of, uh, of a phanazomon and a nitrogen-fixing blue-green alga. And if you look at the reasons why, this is a Statistics Canada map of, of uh, fertilizer application manure application in Western Canada. And you can see the bullseye is right over Alberta. And uh, the addition of, of commercial fertilizer, both nitrogen and phosphorus, has gone up, gone up during the period we're talking about. And the costs here are at, at risk between uh, having to control both nutrients as the the European Union is actually proposing right now and controlling phosphorus alone, you can see here, is about eightfold. And Lake Winnipeg, the same dichotomy is, uh, ha has occurred. You can see it's about sevenfold. So if we can control the problem by controlling phosphorus only, financially it doesn't make sense to control both nutrients. Uh, our data indicate that the uh, problem would come right back even if we did control nitrogen because these nitrogen fixing blue greens would just fix all the nitrogen they needed from the atmosphere. So this is some one case where I think the best science indicates that we could take the less expensive route and uh, yet the government that we have federally seems to think that savings uh, like of this magnitude, which I'm sure would apply to the Great Lakes as well, are inconsequential and the only thing worth putting money into is production of more widgets that we can sell for profit. So I think we have a government that needs to look at both sides of their ledger. Anyhow, that problem is summarized in this book by myself and Jack Valentine, if you want some more detail. We'll go on to the next problem, which is still with us, uh, and that's acid rain. Again, this has totally disappeared from the media. In uh, 1973, I made a presentation to uh, the higher executives of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, based on an earlier version of this map, which showed precipitation of very low pH falling over uh, an area of Canada shown in orange here which had very poor ability to buffer uh, against incoming acids. Exactly the same scenario as it was happening in Scandinavia where damage had been well documented. But uh, I was told I was exaggerating the problem. We didn't have such problems in Canada. Uh, luckily, the Alberta oil sands were just expanding, and they funded our first experiment in Lake 223. We noticed that no one had looked at anything but fish in terms of sensitivity to acidification, and even then, all they'd done is so-called LC50s, where you throw some fish in a tank and titrate the pH down to the acidic value that you wanted to test and count the number of, of fish that were dead after 96 hours. So we thought that a more comprehensive approach was probably necessary. We took this little lake uh, and uh, titrated it slowly down to uh, uh, pH 5, going a quarter of a pH unit a year. And we found uh, that at a pH of 6, 
uh, tenfold less acidic than people were thinking the thresholds started to be crossed, we lost the main food organism for lake trout. Uh, this uh, species of minnow, fathead minnow, uh, which was about 90 some percent of the minnows in that lake. And at the same pH, we also lost uh, this crustacean, which is the main food of younger lake trout in the lake. Both species just quit reproducing. Uh, Mysis only lives about a year, and the, the uh, Pimophales only about three years. So the population started to plummet. And uh, lake trout, which were thought not to be affected at all to pH 5, began to starve. So that lake trout, which looked like that when we began the experiment, were in starving condition and not reproducing because of it to, at pH 5.6, well above the, the point where there was any direct toxicity of acid to the fish. And biodiversity, uh, in going from the original pH of slightly over 6 to uh, uh, 5.0 to 5.1, net loss was about a third of the taxa that we were able to study well in the lake. And even that uh, doesn't reflect the number of species lost, which was around 50%. The reason the net number is only 33 is that we had some new acidophilic taxa come in and replace some of those that were lost, species that had never been seen in the lake before. But even so, this was a, a real eye-opener, I think, to, to scientists, uh, uh, particularly in the U.S. where they didn't want to hear this. Uh, Ronald Reagan had already proclaimed that uh, there were only four lakes below pH 5 in the entire U.S., therefore there was no acid rain problem. And of course nobody wanted to hear about more vulnerable lakes north of the border. In Canada, uh, the data got a better hearing. Interesting thing is this time it was uh, industry that moved first, not government. This, is, this line is the Ministry of Environment control orders for uh, acidifying sulfur emissions, the bars here are what industry was doing. So going back here, uh, industry could see the handwriting on the wall and they began to control their sulfur. And you can see even by the end of, of this slide, industry is running well ahead of what uh, government controls are, are uh, uh, representing. And as a result, we had a huge reduction in the acidity of precipitation in just 10 years from 1980 to 84 averages to 91 to 95 averages. You can see the black and this uh, deeper purple have disappeared uh, and uh, all the other uh, indications have, have dropped. We've had about a two-fold decrease in the acidity of, of precipitation. <clears throat> so again, uh, 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 Ken Mins and, and a group calculated up the, what those reductions and acidifying emissions have meant for species uh, saved and what the likely uh, savings was if you attach some sort of dollar figure to it. And you can see again, the economic figures are, are quite big, even if economics are the only thing you think about. But we still have an acid rain problem. The reason is that we've done nothing to control the other source of, of acidifying emissions, nitrogen oxides. The U.S. began to make a start. They were late compared to Canada in regulating uh, sulfur emissions, but earlier in starting to control nitrogen. This is the Canadian record. There's a slight suggestion of a downward trend here, but not by much. And uh, if you look at the values for uh, acid sensitive parts of, of southern Ontario right now, many areas uh, nitric acid is more prevalent than sulfuric acid. And scientists of Trent have shown that this is causing erosion of calcium from 
soils to the point where it will affect the next generation of forest growth after we cut it, and uh, that crustaceans are beginning to be eliminated from some of the lakes in southern Ontario. So another problem that we've only half solved and one that we need to pay some more attention to. You'll notice that a lot of the other problems that I'm going to talk about here have an ELA connection. And that's really deliberate. Uh, part of it is that I, a lot of my ex-colleagues were happy to supply slides for uh, this presentation. And partly because I think uh, as a group, uh, people have been thinking about what the emerging issues are. And uh, the impetus for this one is what we still hear today from politicians who still call hydroelectric development uh, good green power. The thought is that it doesn't uh, uh, cause any emissions to the atmosphere. Well, some of the scientists at ELA, most notably John Rudd and Carol Kelly, deduced early on that this was not the case. Actually, they did some work on a, a reservoir in northern Manitoba which suggested what went on. And they then did this little experiment uh, on a small lake at ELA where they built a dam about here at the foot of this and flooded that lake. Uh, and this is what it looked like after one year. And then after five years, you can see the dying trees and so on. And uh, nine years later, you, this green area is moss that was flooded that's uh, floated up from the, the flooded peatlands. And what they found is that both emissions of CO2 uh, went up after flooding, and uh, even worse, of methane. Uh, those uh, mats that you could see floating to the surface were uh, of peat that were anoxic in the middle of the, the clumps, and they were emitting methane directly to the atmosphere. So overall, uh, if you do the calculations for Canadian lakes, hydro works out on a greenhouse gas basis at least better than burning coal or some other sources. For some of the tropical reservoirs, if you do the calculations, you might as well just burn the coal. So even, uh, even where uh, the uh, reservoirs are in the planning, we can't assume that they're having no effect on uh, emissions. And uh, uh, concentrations of methyl mercury, of course, went up too. Uh, Oops, I want to go back here. Uh, you can see where flooding began here. And of course, if there's, there's methane being produced, uh, methyl mercury is being mobilized and getting into fish. And of course, this is why Aboriginal food sources have suffered in a lot of parts of Canada uh, around where reservoirs are formed. Well, that takes us on to mercury, which is one of many toxic metals that are of concern, but it's probably worse than most because it has a very complicated geochemistry and also is the source of more consumption advisories for fish in the U.S. and Canada than any other single uh, chemical. Uh, you can see that it's in an ionic form, the HG2 on this graph, which tends to fall back very close to the source, uh, uh, you know, 40 or 50 kilometers, also in a gaseous form, some of which actually travels between continents. Well, again, uh, there's been debate over whether sources of mercury needed to be controlled and whether controlling local sources would do any good. So the Metallicus experiment at ELA decided to investigate that. They added three different stable isotopes of mercury to the uplands, uh, the wetlands, and the lake surface of this small lake. Uh, overall, the calculations show that they increased the mercury loading to this system about fourfold, but the initial mercury loading was low to begin with. And uh, uh, 
what they were able to do was to measure the different isotopes in water and various organisms, including fish, to track where the mercury had come from in the watershed that was causing the problem in fish. To make a long story short, uh, the upward movement into fish was almost all mercury that fell on the surface with a little bit of contribution from the wetlands and almost none from the, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, upland areas of the basin. And as you can see, the new mercury was reflected in fish pretty rapidly. Uh, but even more interesting, after they quit adding these, all of the components, including fish, came down very quickly. This suggests that controlling local sources of mercury would result in, in a rapid decline in mercury and fish. And in the, the debate over whether we should move away from coal-fired power, of course, coal-fired power is the, the biggest source of mercury in almost all areas uh, where mercury is a problem today. So again, this result has enormous uh, financial implications for control of, of, of this substance. And then there's estrogens. Most of us have heard that there are all sorts of things that uh, are getting into our drinking water that are not taken out by sewage treatment. Another experiment at ELA, uh, this one headed by uh, Karen Kidd, uh, put a small amount of the, uh, the uh, uh, estrogen in birth control pills uh, into this small lake. And uh, the result was pretty spectacular. The uh, male fathead minnows became feminized in the lake. Uh, they didn't produce uh, 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 enough sperm to fertilize the females. And the data show that the population really crashed. Uh, you can see that uh, after they began adding this compound, Suddenly, there were only a few very old fish left, almost no fish at all in 2004. Then they quit adding this estrogen, and you can see that within two years, the fish population recovered again. Unfortunately, uh, that experiment wasn't followed up. That suggests to me that uh, estrogens and antibiotics and all sorts of things that are not completely removed by our, our water treatment need to be tested and for in many cases we probably need to do something about them. Areas with population densities like this area I think are, are a possible concern. So far that experiment has resulted in water guidelines, uh, water quality guidelines in British Columbia and, and the EU, but we desperately need some more work on things like this with other species of fish and other ecosystems. And uh, there's some huge uh, policy implications in that uh, without the precise dosing controls of that experiment, there have been feminized male fish uh, found in several places in North America and in fact in the UK and other parts of Europe as well. And uh, work is already going on on improving wastewater treatment in some areas to try and reduce those, those compounds. Uh, and then the last example that I'll give you of, of water quality is the new experiment that is impending at ELA. Uh, a group from Trent University is proposing to test silver nanoparticles in lakes. And uh, if you look around the room, probably 90% of you are sitting or standing on silver right now. If, you're, uh, if your clothes advertise that it has antimicrobial properties, it's probably because there's silver nanofibers woven into it. The reason that's effective is that silver uh, is one of the most effective biocides there is. And uh, yet we gaily add this to our own clothing and all sorts of other uh, things, bandages, uh, gets into washing machines and, and other things like that, and sprayed as a biocide even. 
So the un environmental safety is unknown. These nanoparticles are known to penetrate biological tissues and so on. Uh, but uh, as this slide indicates, few have stopped to ask if nanos are safe. And there are some lab studies indicating that they're not safe. So the first full ecosystem scale experiment uh, to test these uh, uh, started last week. And uh, uh, of course, in all of the things we've tested, we found that if you look at whole ecosystems over a period of years, you see effects that you can't see in small bottles or mesocosms over a period of from hours to months. So my guess is that uh, after the study is done, uh, there will be more work on nanoparticles in order. So one lesson we don't seem to have learned is uh, one we should have learned from DDT, and that is if something is hard on one organism, it's probably hard on us and organisms that we value too. None of us, from microbes to us, have, a, have big variations in our DNA and RNA, and uh, it makes sense that a biocide that affects one level is going to affect uh, multicellular organisms and all levels of a food chain. And then moving west, one final example, this is uh, the slide that was the uh, basis for the quote that, that Heidi quoted me as saying, every impact statement done for the oil sands, uh, all of the analogs to the Northern Gateway thing have proclaimed uh, that the ecological costs of oil sands mining are negligible. Well, you fly over the area, this is what you see. And I think you could load up uh, village idiots nominated by communities around the world on a plane and give them a, a, a ballot and say yes or no, is this a significant environmental impact? And I'd think they'd say yes. But our politicians believe these reports. Uh, so this is what we get for a landscape. Uh, we have the most rapid development that's ever occurred in this country. Seven and a half percent a year means a doubling every 10 years. And it's uh, more or less equivalent to the rate of development uh, uh, of science during the Manhattan Project, for example, uh, or to put a man on the moon, and the cost invested in the oil sand, sands is many times higher than either of those projects. And we see uh, fish in the Athabasca River that look like this. Uh, the Alberta government's answer is that it's all natural. Uh, this is their official statement. A uh, number of indicators that that was unlikely to be true. Uh, the most conspicuous being that industry itself was reporting that almost every known toxin on the periodic table and almost every known uh, organic toxin found in fossil fuels was being emitted by their upgraders at higher and higher amounts. These are, th these are their own reporting compiled by uh, Environment Canada's National Pollutant Release Inventory which of course was kept secret until uh, uh, EcoJustice and a couple of environmental groups challenged this in court and, and won about 10 years ago. But the reason they could say this is they weren't measuring it, weren't measuring the fallout back into the, the systems. So we did, and to make a long story short, we found that polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and uh, all sorts of other pollutants, uh, including things like mercury and arsenic and lead, were falling out in snowpacks uh, at an exponential rate away from these stacks. And uh, finally, uh, we started to be believed after several uh, expert panels examined the data and said that we were right and the government was wrong. And now, of course, we have studies by Environment Canada that are showing that this is the case. So there's a bit of backpedaling. We have that as a problem we still need to investigate. We really don't know in any detail the connection between the 
which pollutants going into the river are causing deformities in fish, or if the two are just coincidence. I don't think they are because the same sorts of deformities occurred in the ocean after the Exxon Valdez uh, uh, spill, and after the Deepwater Horizon, deformed fish which looked much like the array we found in the oil sands have started to be found in the Gulf of Mexico. In, there are embryological studies of fish done by Environment Canada that suggest that the malformations occur when the fish are in an embryonic form, living right down close to the substrates that are high in these compounds. But the big problem, and I flag this because this is a big problem that is exacerbated by Northern Gateway, is uh, if we had a tailings pond breach, it would be game over if it was in the oil sands for the McKenzie system, and if it's uh, any one of the major rivers of the some 900 fish-bearing streams that the Northern Gateway Pipeline will cross, uh, we, there is no known way that that oil can be removed uh, from a river under ice. And I show you this as an example. This is the Athabasca River. It's in this state for an average of five months per year. Uh, the underside of this ice is much rougher than the top side. Uh, as ice forms, it goes downstream in frazzle ice, uh, uh, sort of globular mixtures which then connect on bends and then break broken portions of the ice to where it's very irregular. You can't put skimmers on this system anywhere and the oil is all hung up on the ice. We know this well. We've had an example in 1982 of oil released by a fire at Suncor. Uh, all the government was able to do was watch helplessly as it drifted downstream and by spring breakup it was in Lake Athabasca where the fishery was closed for two years. And we had a reminder just last Halloween at the Obed coal mine, which is well upstream on the Athabasca, same sort of dike rupture released 60 million liters of tailings to the river. And the government's response was we can't tell if it's having any effect because the river is frozen over and we'll let you know in the spring. So these are some of the warning signals that you will not find discussed in this uh, report of the expert committee uh, that uh, our prime minister and his officials tout so highly as proving that Northern Gateway is safe. Uh, there was a conference on this by engineering experts just two years ago at the University of Alberta. And the end conclusion was that there is no known way to remove oil spills from under ice, period. So that's the sort of background we have uh, uh, for the decisions that are being made today. And of course, this is uh, where the product will end up if it makes it through the pipeline, this uh, narrow rocky channel that uh, connects out into the Pacific Ocean. We have another problem that it's time we have to solve. And I think if it can't be solved anywhere else, we've got to solve this at the ballot box. When I came to Canada, uh, we were encouraged to communicate science to the public, even as uh, members of, of federal science organizations. We certainly were never restricted from speaking out at conferences. Well, this is the case today. This cartoon appeared after it was found that handlers uh, were accompanying Canadian scientists uh, to these Arctic conferences to make sure they didn't say anything that was out of line with Harper government policy. I've known one other government to do that. It was the Soviet Union in the early 70s where KGB agents were sent with their scientists to listen in. and. Uh, 
if they uh, said anything out of line, they didn't go to any more meetings, and in fact, they usually disappeared. So uh, all of this is known internationally. This was the subject of an editorial in the world's premier science journal, Nature, uh, urging Canadian scientists to be advocates for the sort of science that uh, was going on in this country that uh, sort of dictated the path that science indicated policy should take. So this muzzling is no more than a deliberate attempt to make sure that science that is contrary to the economic agenda of this country is not heard. Yet uh, elsewhere, the philosophy uh, through most of the EU and other countries in the Western world, I think is reflected in this. This is Gro Harlem Brundtland, uh, the first author of the Brundtland Report, that science should underpin our policies. And certainly in a democracy, science should inform a voting populace because uh, a poorly informed or misinformed uh, populace in a democracy is not going to drive decisions in the right direction. And of course, uh, the policy makers, while they silence the scientists, don't listen to it themselves either. So we hear things that have the ridiculous assumption that they will find uh, relevant policy science in the ivory towers and turn it uh, into appropriate legislation without any help. I think that's absurd. This is really what's going on. We have policy being made in Canada in a science vacuum, and this has to stop. So we re really need to rebuild Canadian water scientists. We've had federal labs which have been repeatedly cut to where their staffs are shadows of what they were in the 1970s when we were regarded as, as a worldwide model in water science for the sort of science that needed to be done and the sort of public communication that needed to be, to be done. We really need to get our labs at arm's length from politicians. We pay the scientists' salary and research costs. We don't need to have the results politicized and spun. We need to know the results if we're to support decision making with anything intelligent to have that information for ourselves. I think we could do better with those labs by having university links. We still have, for the most part, universities that are too small for effective uh, uh, interdisciplinary research. We don't have the Woods Holes and the Scripps Institutions uh, in Canada that we have south of the border, for example. And we could have for a much lower cost by uh, merging some of these big labs with universities and closer cooperation. And we need some political recognition of the importance to of water both to people and ecosystems. We've had water policy talked about since the early 1980s. We still have nothing. And as I mentioned earlier, we really need to recognize uh, what the limits to population and industrial growths are uh, and uh, keep them at a sustainable level. So this is more for scientists in the audience and. I think we need some incentives in universities. Uh, right now, scientists, particularly younger scientists, are so busy and so afraid of not making tenure that they're afraid, afraid to say anything controversial, even if they know it's right. Uh, we need to free civil servants to speak out the way they once could, and uh, they should be advising us. We're their bosses, not politicians. We need, uh, we, had a, we have a prime minister that eliminated the office of a science advisor. I'd say not only the prime minister, but all of the environmental ministers should have scientific advice so that they can, if they're going to make decisions that are ecologically unsound, they should be prepared to tell us why they're making them, not sweep the science under the rug. Uh, we really need 
better training for graduate students in public communication. And uh, in this day of the cell phone, when everybody has an excellent camera, keep your eye out for, uh, I think part of the problem with scientists willing to communicate is most of them don't know how to speak to anybody outside of the ivory tower. One uh, example I'll give you is I took a young chemist who was working with me up to Lac La Biche to talk to a group of fishermen and locals. And, uh, he was studying compounds in drinking water, which he referred to as racemic enantiomers. Uh, you could just see people's eyes glaze over, and he could have just told them that they were identical chemicals except they were mirror images or something that would have made more sense. Uh, and, of course, we have desperate need for uh, science journali journalism that make sense. Instead of what we see in climate where if there's somebody who shows something is happening to, uh, to cause the climate to change, he immediately searches hard for somebody who will say the opposite and there's one of each of them put up, which makes it look like uh, the, uh, the argument is not solved when any look at the literature indicates that it is. Anyhow, the last slide, all of these uh, people I think will be at tomorrow's uh, uh, thing, except for Karen Kidd, I'm told, can't make it. Uh, I've seen most of these people in the audience, and uh, if you want to know more detail about some of the things that I gave briefly here, I'm sure they'd be happy to discuss them with you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming.